I kept thinking about how to interpret the Bible, how to determine what it is God wants us to do, how to make him happy with our choices. And there are some other things that we should look at, which I think fit under a category that I'm going to call, make these words your actions. <laughs> uh, it was the best I could do for something that fit on a title slide. So stick with me on that. But uh, it's back to John chapter 7, and we talk about our will. Will to do God's will, meaning you determine that this is what you want to do. Um, if you will, we all can start with a blank slate. We can start with a, um, you know, like as if we don't know anything about what God wants us to do or anything about what uh, constitutes the service of God, we can do that uh, and approach the Bible and let the Bible prescribe and, uh, and or dictate. But I like the word prescribe, uh, meaning it gives us exactly what to do in a fairly positive way. Um, for the most part, there are some things where it says not like this or not in this, but for the most part, it sets forth things in a positive way, showing this is what God desires, this is what they did that was good, etc. In John 7, we uh, want to pick up kind of the big picture here, which begins at verse 14. Um, and it says, Jesus went into the temple and began to teach. The Jews marveled because he was teaching and the reason they marveled, it, marveled is, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? Uh, by which they mean he has never gone to one of our schools. <laughs> uh, which doesn't mean he's never studied or never known the word of God. In fact, he knew it very well. And uh, Luke had recorded uh, that Jesus, as a boy, had been left in the temple one year by accident. You know, when the family's traveling and it's large, and especially when you're traveling with relatives and you think maybe the boy is with your brother or your cousin or your uncle or something, you leave town and he's there. Well, he got left in the temple. And it said the teachers there were impressed with him, that he was asking questions and, and speaking with them in ways they had not expected at all. So he has something that comes from God that is within him. Um, but their thinking is, you know, this has to come from schooling here in some way. Uh, you know, he didn't come through our circles. He didn't come through our teachers, through our tradition. Um, you know, how is it that he can be up there teaching like he is? And the answer to this Jesus gives is, I think, very important at the 16th when he said, my teaching is not mine. He doesn't have to go to school and he doesn't have to get cultured and, um, you know, brought up on the traditions of um, Jerusalem and the Jerusalem uh, religious elite at that time. He just needs to know what God's teaching is. And that is what he's doing. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Which is to say... He's not adding to it. He's not taking from it. He didn't author it. He didn't fashion it. He's just giving them what he was given. This is the context in which he said, if anyone's will is to do God's will, this is the person who will know whether the teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority is seeking his own glory. The one who seeks the glory of the person who sent him this one is true, and in this one is no falsehood. So it has a lot to do with your will being to do God's will. You're, you've decided and determined in your mind that you are going to figure out what he wants you to do, and that's what you're going to do. It's not coming from you. It's not serving you or glorifying you. And this is kind of what we're getting at as we start with this blank slate. It's effectively coming to this and listening, you know, make up your mind that I'm not bringing anything to the, to the discussion here. I'm not bringing anything to the table here. I'm going to let the word prescribe what should be done. 
And when I read in the Bible that it calls for this or that this was done, then I'll do that. Um, and when you do that, you're allowing you know God to draw the picture and God to draw the plans and, and the things that ought to be done and, and need to be done are cared for in his word. Um, you know, there may be things that people do that are not in his word and those can be left out safely. And in many cases, they should be left out. In many cases, they must be left out. But the point of this is to let the word prescribe what is done. And that does mean that sometimes you're going to reject additions to the recorded word. You use the word itself to figure out two things. First of all, what should I do? Uh, and second of all, how should I do it? And the word provides for this. This is meant to be good news because what we're saying is God has given us something we can understand and something we can take hold of. He hasn't left us in the dark or wondering in some kind of unsettled predicament, wishing that God had been more clear about what he wants. It's not, that's not the Bible. Um, the Bible is very clear about what he wants. And so we're looking to read it to find in there what do they do, what should I do, and how. And uh, I think this is an important way of approaching things. Um, when I talk about this kind of blank slate, another way of describing that is to know only Christ. And uh, this is the phrase that I'm borrowing from what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. Um, it's not just, um, you know, rhetorical flourish. What he means by this is that he was making a trip back to Corinth to deal with some problems there. And when he went, he made up his mind ahead of time that he would go and he was not going to know something else. He wasn't going to go as the leading Jewish teacher from Israel or as a Roman citizen or as a um, somebody who was schooled in Greek philosophy, although he obviously was, uh, since he quotes them on more than one occasion. He's going with a predetermined agenda, which is Jesus and only Jesus. When I came to you, brothers, he said in verse 1, beginning, I didn't come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, which should be avoided. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he said, I didn't come with lofty speech or with wisdom. These should be avoided because the result of the lofty speech and wisdom is a faith that's not real, a faith that's built on the wisdom of men. He said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, meaning he determined ahead of time that he wasn't going to talk about any other matters. It was just going to be this, which means we limit our consideration to the testimony of God in Christ. This is what I mean when I say blank slate. We're coming to this thing, not bringing anything else in to cloud the picture. Let the Bible testify. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Rather, they were in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That's a humility, a humble approach here. But the result is verse 5, and I think it's the most important thing, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, very important that the faith is built in the power of God when it is brought forth with a strict scope set to just the testimony of God in Christ, not any other thing, with um, the person bringing it forth doing so in humility as a servant, stepping aside, 
not bringing in human wisdom and and uh, all the things that appeal to men when that is the case and the word in its purity is brought forth and you also can believe and you have that faith that comes by hearing and hearing the word of God that faith that is resting on the power of God yeah if we limit what we look at to just what is testified <coughs> if we approach it in that humble way where the human method or the human messenger by which this is relayed to us is you know not in consideration then the result is that we have a faith that's built on the power of God that's what we're trying to do so another thing that comes up if you're thinking about it in positive terms that's one way if we think about it in negative terms we would look at it like this there are things that are said and there are things that are not said and it's actually important according to Hebrews chapter 7 beginning at verse 11 here we have an example of um, a teaching about what is said and what is not said that I want to dissect with you for a little bit and I hope you don't find these things pedantic uh, Hebrews 7 11 if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood for under the Levit Levitical priesthood the people received the law the law of Moses if they could have gotten perfection through that priesthood well what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron He's asking this question in retrospect of the psalm that said, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, a psalm of David. So a psalm written centuries into the history of Israel and the history of the Levitical priesthood. Why would somebody who himself was serving under the Levitical priesthood in ancient Israel, um, why would he mention by the Holy Spirit another priest? in a different order entirely Melchizedek who is not even an Israelite he was a contemporary of Abraham uh, that's why he's saying this because what he's really getting at the writer here is getting at the idea that the law is going to change and even David knew the law was going to change the reason why I say that that's what four means, by the way. When you read four in the New Testament, it means that thing I said there. The reason I said that is. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 12, when there is a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. It's necessary that the law must change when the priesthood changes. Well, why is that a necessary thing? It's necessary because in the 13th verse, the one about whom these things are spoken, that is to say the priesthood of Melchizedek, belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. It's evident that our Lord Jesus was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. The conclusion is that this means the law changed in Christ. The priesthood changed. So if we're thinking about these verses together, we're saying the law here, the law of Moses, effectively is a representation of religious authority. We mean it's that prescribing authority that, that tells them what to do. Who can be a priest and who cannot be a priest? We're not so much interested in priesthoods or uh, prophecy or, uh, you know, the interpretation of types and foreshadowing things, which are all very interesting. And I love those studies, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're just saying we're picking up on what he said, which is a different priesthood means a different law, because that's telling us how we figure out what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do. But here, 
the argument is based on the fact that something was not said. A different priesthood means a different law. So, uh, you know, in other words, a different priesthood can only be legal if there's a different law. This law, you know, doesn't make it legal to have a different priesthood. That's another way of looking at it. This, all he's saying is that that's, that's, um, combined in a way that it cannot be undone. And that's what we need to figure out. Why is that? Why is it that a different priesthood has to mean that there's a different law? Well, the reason that the Spirit gives in Hebrews 7 is this. In connection with Judah, Moses said nothing about priests. Moses wrote the law. The law says nothing about priests from Judah. Right? The law says the priests are chosen from Levi. And it prescribes Levi. And it talks about Levi and his sons, Aaron and his sons. The tribe of Judah is not part of the tribe of Levi. It's parallel to Levi. It's a different tribe, not Levi. <coughs> Therefore, the law of Moses does not appoint a priest from Judah. It appoints priests from Levi. Pre if somebody from Judah is a priest, it's not because the law said he could be a priest. It doesn't. That would not be allowed in the law of Moses. Priests are chosen from Levi. Judah is not Levi, therefore, priests are not chosen from Judah. So if somebody is a priest, and, and that person is from Judah, that tells you that whatever authority made him a priest was not this one. It wasn't the law of Moses. It has to be the case that that person became a priest, was appointed a priest, um, you know, has a priesthood that is governed by some other law, not the law of Moses. That's what he means when he says necessarily. So what we're getting at is if the law had appointed priests, say from among the people, with no mention to the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Levi, or any other tribe, just appoint priests from among the people. Well, then priests of any tribe would be legal under the law of Moses. If the law had said, appoint priests, and never mentioned any tribe from which to appoint them, just appoint priests from among the people, well, then the priests could come from any tribe. That would have been okay, because they're from among the people. But you know that's not what happened. The law explicitly named one tribe, Levi. Now that's binding in the sense that the law does not have to say, appoint priests from Levi and not from Reuben and not from Naphtali and not from Judah and not from Simeon. It doesn't have to say that. All it has to say is appoint priests from the tribe of Levi. That necessarily means they're not from Reuben. They're not from Naphtali. They're not from Judah. Because those are not Levi. It said Levi. So when he explicitly tells them, appoint priests from the sons of Aaron, appoint the priestly class from the tribe of Levi, that's good enough. That's all he has to say. He doesn't have to say you shall not appoint a priest from Reuben. And a lot of times people read the Bible that way. Well, it doesn't say not to you. That doesn't mean that it's authorized. You got to look at what did it tell you? What did it say to do? Well, it doesn't say not to. See, the problem with it doesn't say not to is you're not letting the Bible prescribe. 
whenever somebody has, uh, it doesn't say not to, what that implies is there's already something that I want to do. <laughs> or maybe I'm already doing it. And I come and I do this thing and somebody says to me, why are you doing that? That's when you hear, well, it doesn't say not to. Right, that's not authority. That's not the right heart. That is the wrong attitude entirely. We have to start from a place of your will is to do God's will. You determined ahead of time to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. It doesn't have to say not to. You have to show that this is what it said to do in order to do it. It's not a matter of, oh, I just, I want to do that. I like that. That seems nice. And it doesn't say not to. So that means it's okay. No, that's not how this works. What did it say to do? Do that. What did they do? Do that. And when God explicitly gives something, in this case, Levi is one tribe of, the, of all the tribes, that clearly means none of the other tribes is accepted. And I'm not just making that up, right? It is exactly, um, you know, it's exactly what the text uh, said to us there in Hebrews 7, and I'm not a, the scroll is broken in, in PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Give me a second here. When there's a change in the priesthood, there has to be a change in the law too. The one about whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one's ever served. It's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. That tells you that Jesus' priesthood is not a Levitical priesthood and Jesus' law is not the law of Moses. It has to be that way. Uh, yeah, there's not another way of doing that. Consider this one with me. I keep forgetting that the scroll is broken. Give me a second. <laughs> As an example of things said and not said, take with me Ephesians 5, 19 very quickly with singing versus playing. Ephesians 5, 19 um, is one passage that talks about how we uh, worship God in song, and it says we are addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And uh, the other passage is Colossians 3, and, it, and it's virtually identical. So we're just going to use this one. First of all, it says that we address one another. That's what it says to do. If you are singing and you are addressing one another, then you're doing what you were told to do. That is clearly what God wants. When he says address one another, he does not have to say address one another and don't put anything in your mouth that prevents you from speaking like a trumpet. He doesn't have to say that. He just said address one another. You can't do that with a harmonica in your mouth. Right? You cannot play an instrument with the mouth, certainly, and also address one another. He said address one another. It's explicitly calling you for, you know, for you to use your words <laughs> as you talk to one another in the Lord. And that's good enough, isn't it? What are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to use words, and those words are intended for the others to understand them. He doesn't have to say, address one another in a language that you speak and understand. He shouldn't have to say that. Apparently he did, if you read 1 Corinthians. <laughs> but those people were crazy. You should look at the other things they were doing. Um, he shouldn't have to say that, right? He just has to say, address one another. Does an instrument address people? No, it doesn't. So it's not fulfilling the commandment. Well, why, why are you doing it? It doesn't say not to. Well, that's not the point. The point is, what did it say to do? It said, address one another. You're not using an instrument to address somebody, so why are you using it at all? Did it say to do that? I didn't read that in the passage. 
It also said to address one another with a specific libretto, if you like that word. Specific words, which are psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. It doesn't have to say address one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and not with secular songs, and not with the songs of other religions. <laughs> right? It doesn't have to say that. It just put forth what is right. We'll use psalms. We'll use hymns to God. We will also use spiritual songs. These qualify as the things with which we can address one another. He doesn't have to say, and not secular songs. That's good enough, right? It should be fairly plain. Like he puts forth, this is what we sing, that necessarily excludes every other thing. You have to address one another. You can't do something that doesn't allow you to address one another. You have to use psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We can't use something that isn't a psalm, a hymn, or a spiritual song. You're told to make melody as well, by the way. Literally, pluck strings. Well, what strings are we plucking? Does this mean everybody must have a guitar? No, it doesn't. And you know, uh, by the way, people who talk about using a guitar who say well it does say solo solo which means plucking a string it does mean plucking a string but if that uh is referring to a stringed instrument mechanically made by the human being as in a guitar then where's your guitar everybody here has to do it because it's commanded it's not just somebody up front in a performance role is allowed to strum a guitar no you're worshiping you're addressing one another it's psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And if what it means is you must pluck strings, well, then you must pluck strings. Uh, every, everybody must pluck strings. But that's not the case. Specifically, we are told to pluck the strings of the heart. Literally, it says to make melody with your heart. It does not have to say make melody with your heart, not with a guitar, not with clapping, not with humming. It doesn't have to say that. It tells you what instrument. The instrument is the heart. If you are addressing one another, and what you are addressing one another with are the words of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and you are making melody with your heart, then you are doing exactly what God said to do. Well, why do people use guitars, or why do people clap or hum? Well, because they want to. There's nothing in the text that tells them to do that. Now, they might say, but it doesn't say not to. Well, it doesn't have to say not to. It said priests are appointed from Levi. That means priests are not appointed from Judah. It says sing and make melody with the heart. It says address one another doesn't have to say don't use any other instrument it gives you the instrument to use you use that instrument it's the heart um, and if we start that with the Lord's Supper this one's more complicated but we can do it uh, it's one of my favorite examples actually uh, but I realized it was a lot more complicated than the singing service but the Lord's Supper is governed in the same way you know, if you look back in Matthew 26, to begin with, at verse 26, they're eating the Passover. And Jesus, while they're eating the Passover, does a new thing. He picks up bread and blesses it and breaks it and gives it to the disciples and says, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he also took a cup and having given thanks, gave it to them and said, drink from this, all of you, for I, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I won't drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. He's saying, we're not going to have this meal again until that day in my father's kingdom. That's the church that we're talking about. 
Um, you know, evidence for that would be, say, Mark 9, 1. He said, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. In Acts 1, 8, he told the apostles, you stay here until you are endued with power from on high. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses. <coughs> in Acts 2, 1, they were together on the day of Pentecost in one place. And then in verse 4, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. In other tongues, you know, the rest of that, that tells you that the kingdom of God came on that day. And that would tell you why in Mark 9, 1, he could say there's people alive listening to me preach who will still be alive when the day of the kingdom comes. So when he says, I'm not going to drink of this until I do so with you in my father's kingdom, it's clear he's pointing to the time of the church. But think about it this way, to a Jewish person, the Passover meal seems a little bit odd without lamb. They have the unleavened bread and they have the unleavened wine, but where's the lamb? Well, Jesus is the lamb. <laughs> Jesus is the lamb. That's why it's the Lord's Supper. And that's telling us some specific things. It memorializes Jesus. He said, do this in memory of me. In memory, like in memoriam. Um, it's a memorial, something where, like, like a grave marker or like the things on the back glass of cars sometimes when somebody's passed away or something at the side of a road where somebody has passed away in an accident. It's a memorial. We remember that Jesus died. It's a memorial that, because it's the Passover, consists of unleavened bread and unleavened wine, which is fruit of the vine, of course, grape juice. It conspicuously omits the lamb from that Passover meal because Jesus is the lamb. And it's going to be eaten in the kingdom. That's in the church. Those things are very clear just from what Jesus said in Matthew 26. Is there anything more precise than this about how they did this? We know that it's to be done, but, you know, how? How? Well, in Acts 20, uh, at verse 6, there is an account of somebody taking the Lord's Supper that is specific about it. It really is the only account that tells us anything about when they did it. So it says uh, Luke and Paul and the rest of his traveling company came uh, to the Christians at Troas, where they stayed for a week. And then on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. I did get a chuckle, by the way, when I did a word study on prolonged, and it's the word for stretch out, but it's usually used for torturing people on the rack. <laughs> <laughs> so I take that to heart, and think, try not to make lessons too long. That was pretty good. It was already good that um, Eutychus, I don't know if you know this, but the name Eutychus is actually just a Greek word for lucky. So that's also pretty funny. The lucky fell out of the window. Um, anyway, Paul talked until midnight, it says in the seventh verse. In the eleventh verse, Paul went up later. He had gone up, he broke bread and ate. And then he conversed with them a long while. Converse here is um, social interaction, which is telling me that services ended and he stuck around and talked with them until daybreak. That's how he left. So they left Monday at daybreak, but they had gone to worship on Sunday. They stayed up at least till midnight. He was preaching. Verse 7 had said, he was preaching so long that a kid fell asleep and fell out of the window. And the Lord granted Paul the ability to revive the child, bring him back safely, not child, but young man, safely. And when that was done, he went back up to where they were meeting and broke bread and ate. That is to say, he took the Lord's Supper. And then at some point here, services are over and he conversed with them for a long while after that. Till daybreak. 
that's telling us things about how they did this. They assembled to break bread on Sunday. That's the first day of the week, is what it said. The assembly continued into the night. It had to, because Paul was preaching until midnight. And it was after Eutychus fell out of the window, and after Paul revived him, that he went up, he went back up and partook of the Lord's Supper. It was well after midnight when he did that. Paul took the Lord's Supper sometime after midnight. We, we don't know exactly when the assembly started. It doesn't say. But we do know that it concluded sometime after he took the Lord's Supper because then he just hung around and talked with people until daybreak. Verse 11. But you see, there's things here that we know from what we read there. One thing is, the Lord's Supper was taken in the assembly. They assembled to break bread. That's a prescription for how you do this. They, we see that in that case, they assembled on Sunday to break bread. Um, that's what is recorded. They were there for seven days, and then a Sunday popped up, and they assembled to take bread. That tells you something about days. We are told that Paul preached until midnight, and then Eutychus fell out the window. And then he healed Eutychus, or revived, or, or, or resurrected Eutychus, whatever that was. And then he took the Lord's Supper. Paul is said to have taken the Lord's Supper at that point. That's telling us that, well, it was done in the assembly. It was done Sunday. It was done at basically any hour. Then we go over to 1 Corinthians 11, and there's some more details here don't want to spend too much time but there's just some things here that are helpful so the 17th verse is where Paul begins and he says I do not have a commendation for you because you're coming together for the worse not for the better <laughs> the reason is they were making some specific mistakes with regard to the Lord's Supper the 20th verse says when you come together it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating oh they're eating all right but it's not the Lord's Supper see that's telling us that we can know what the Lord's Supper is and we can also know what it's not. We can know what the Lord's will is and we can know what it's not. Their problem at 21 is each one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. That is to say, full. They're at totally opposite ends of the spectrum here. What, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Should I commend you in this? No, I won't. Then he tells them, the Lord did this as they were eating. It was Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. What he means in the same way, he took the bread in the same way as the bread, he took the cup, after supper his point is it's not the meal it's what you and i often hear called emblems symbolic servings small portions that represent the passover meal en enough unleavened bread to realize it's unleavened enough unleavened wine to realize it's unleavened that what you're doing here are passover items it doesn't mean you have to eat a loaf or a roll. Just enough to be able to tell what you're doing. It wasn't the meal. They're not supposed to be getting nourishment. Or I shouldn't say that. What it tells us is the Lord, what he prescribed was this. These memorial portions, not the meal. In the conclusion, he says to them, 33, my brothers, so when you come together to eat, wait for one another so they're coming together to eat too we read in Acts 20 how that they assembled to break bread here he said when you come together to eat wait for one another this is a practice that's consistent with Acts 20 and at verse 34 if anyone is hungry let him eat at home so that when you come together it won't be for judgment 
which again, it's telling us you can know whether this is right or wrong and it matters to get it right. So what we're seeing here is Corinth was rebuked for two specific problems. The first one is they're being selfish. They're concerned only with themselves and filling their belly, their, their own meal. That's not Christian. That's not loving. That's not what the church is about. It's not meant for those kinds of things. And they're rebuked for making the Lord's Supper out of a common meal, um, which it never was. It was it was always a memorial portion as evidenced by the fact that he did these things after supper in a symbolic way. The apostle also told them two things they can do to solve this pro these problems. The first one is when they come together, they wait for one another. Which is to say, perhaps they wait on one another, um, like serve each other. But I think the idea is that this is orderly and in turn. And it's saying that when you come together, that's how you conduct yourself. You, you're, you're in service, you're, you're orderly. You know, it's not one guy gets completely full, somebody else hasn't had anything at all. Like It's just thoughtless and selfless, that's not right. The other prescription is the Lord's Supper is no common meal. Common meals should be eaten at home. It's okay to eat. Just do it at home. <laughs> and give thanks. But this is telling us, with regard to the Lord's Supper, that what we eat is a, a symbolic portion, a, a small thing, enough to tell what you're doing, not a full meal. It also tells us that we serve one another while doing this, and we do so in an orderly fashion, taking turns, not thoughtless or selfless. It's telling you that the Lord's Supper is taken, again, out of these small pieces of bread, these small portions of juice, enough to tell that it's unleavened bread and unleavened wine. It's taken in the assembly. Every account of this is in the assembly of the Lord. It's taken on Sunday. I can't say every account of it is on Sunday. I can say there is one account, and that account is on Sunday. <laughs> We saw that Paul was able to partake of this after midnight, but they were still assembled from the first day. We know that they serve one another in turn. You can, so, or in turn. This can be done at basically any time on the first day of the week in the assembly. And as a counterexample, we have no mention of of taking the Lord's Supper outside the assembly. Nowhere does it talk about taking the Lord's Supper somewhere other than as the assembled saints. That doesn't exist in Scripture. And all the things we talked about before apply. Sometimes people will say, well, it doesn't say not to. It doesn't have to say not to. What did it say to do? And is that what you're doing? Well, it doesn't say not to take it to people who are at the hospital. Well, but where is the example of the saints assembling? in the hospital where did they do that where does it say that they assemble and are doing that in somebody's private uh, purview in their hospital room or at their campsite or around the 18th hole at the golf course dare we say <laughs> that's outside the assembly that's outside of the scriptures there's no mention of anybody taking the Lord's Supper on a Monday or a Wednesday or a Friday, any other day. The only mention of what day they did this, the same as when did they do it? They did it when they were assembled. What day was it? It was Sunday. That's the only thing that is found there. It's prescribed. If you're not trying to do something else or not trying to fulfill some existing pattern or practice or idea, but rather just letting the Bible prescribe what should be done, then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to take the Lord's Supper on Sunday in the assembly by taking turns in an orderly fashion, and it's going to consist of unleavened bread and unleavened wine in memorial portion, not a meal. Because that's what it says. If you're doing these things, you're doing what God said to do. That's the idea. 
So that's what we mean, um, you know, when we get to talking about turning these actions or these words into actions. We have words for all of those things. You can show. Here's why we're singing. Here's why we're making melody with our heart. Here's why the things we are singing are psalms or hymns or spiritual songs, right? Here's why we take the Lord's Supper. Here's why we take it on Sundays. Here's why we take it when we're assembled. Here's why we use unleavened bread and unleavened wine. Here's why we do this with kindness and service. And you can point to all these things and show here's what the Bible prescribed that we do. And you know those and you can point to a verse or verses that demonstrate that this is what's being done and this is why it's being done. You turn that into action and you're good. You're okay. You have Bible for what you're doing. Uh, yeah. I knew an older fella, and some of you also knew the older fella. Um, maybe some of you did. I think maybe at least one of you did, but anyway. And he was from a different religious tradition, but he attended services with us all the time, and he just couldn't let go of his family members who had participated in that instrumental music that they were very good at apparently and talented with and uh, you know he would just say Brother preacher you don't have any verse that condemns it and I said you don't have any verse that prescribes it you don't have any verse for what you're doing I can point to the Bible and say here's what we're doing and why where is your verse that tells you that you should be doing that it doesn't exist, right? That's the issue here. I, I, you know, was not successful in getting through to the gentleman, unfortunately. But um, that was that's the bottom line. Is look, you know, I don't need to have a verse that condemns a specific practice. I need to have a verse that prescribes the practice that I hold, and other practices have to be excused or uh, excluded from that. I need a verse that prescribes what I'm doing. And if there's not a verse for this, then don't do it. Um, it's not coming from God. It's It wasn't God's will that you were seeking to do when you decided to do that. If it had been God's will that you were seeking to do, then you would have seen the verse. The verse would have told you what to do, and you would be able to point back to the verse. Well, here, this is the thing we're doing. This is the way that you do that. That would be straightforward. But in the absence of that, we're in the absence of authority. The absence of that is a clear indicator that I'm trying to do my will, not the will of the one who sent Jesus. Now that's another way of thinking about it when we talk about make these words into your actions. So I hope that these are helpful ways of reconfiguring uh, and uh, or re-explaining uh, these things or taking different angles at the same idea. Uh, I've had a lot of trouble thinking about them in uh, trying to come up with ways that might be helpful to you, but I hope that that's useful and we may have others. We'll see. But at this time, we always uh, take the time to talk about becoming a Christian, becoming a child of God. So today, if you are not a Christian, Put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins because, well, the Bible says so, Acts 2.38 and other places. If you are already a Christian and not living right, repent and pray God for forgiveness because, well, the Bible says so in Acts 8. How Simon was told to pray God that he might be forgiven. And he did ask the, uh, the people to pray for him too. So if you want the prayers of the saints, we're glad to pray with you for you. But you might be restored to him. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.